We're just talking. <laughs> still, just one more quick check. Can you still hear me okay? You can up a little higher, volume-wise. Okay, let me... Um, I'm, I have a Mac first time, and I'm still making version. So, let's see. Is it yeah, better. Much better. Good. We'll go there. Uh, very good. Why don't, we, um, why don't we get officially started before we get back into kind of what you guys were talking about at some point, probably. Let me do a... We have kind of normal introduction that we do when we record these things. So, um, well, another of our Saturday webinars made here by the Ashbrook Center, which is an independent center at Ashland University, offering resources to help teachers teach us what it means to be Americans. My name is Chris Burkett. I am Associate Professor of Political Science and History, as well as Chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government Program here at Ashland University. Um, this year's theme for our webinars is presidents and their times. We're um, pulling some interesting scholars and thinkers today uh, to talk about um, James Madison as a for union and constitutional self-government. And um, drawing from some documents that are included in our database of documents available at teachingamericanhistory.org. Or if you want to access that, you can simply type in tah.org. A wealth of resources right at your fingertips online. Uh, this conversation, please feel free to jump in with questions via the chat. Feature. We'll try to get to as many uh, as many questions as possible in the course of our conversation. Uh, I'll remind you that you will receive an email. Receive an email with um, with a link to request a certificate of participation today. So again, as I've said, our, our, our theme for today's webinar is James Madison, and we've, we've asked participants to read a, a five documents from our database, ranging from a piece on parties, uh, which Professors Porteous and Postel were just discussing, I think, perhaps, uh, resolutions, Madison's first inaugural address, his war message to Congress, and the later letter after his political retirement to Nicholas Trist. Um, let me introduce our panelists formally here, Joe Postel. Is a professor of political science at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. He is editor of Rediscovering Political Economy, and he contributes frequently to the Liberty Fund's Library of Law and Liberty website. If you haven't seen that, it's worth checking out. Kevin Porter is associate professor of political science at Hillsdale College, courses on American political thought and institutions, among other things, and he has also written about the presidency, especially the executive. Administrative functions. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Kevin. That was actually was that the topic of your dissertation, if I remember correctly, right? Yes, it was. Something like that. I point out that both uh, Joe and Kevin are alums of, of the Brooks Scholar Program for graduates here at Ashland University, and I also had the pleasure and honor of, um, of, of, of engaging graduate studies with them at the University of Dallas. So this is something of a of a, of a reunion uh, for me, and I've been looking forward to this for. Uh, I've always looked forward to, to the chance for us to, to chat of things as always. So good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Today. I thought the way we would start this off was just by me throwing out a big question, and uh, you either choose to address it or or ignore it, and just do your own thing and talk about whatever you want to talk about with regard to Madison. Um, but the big question, I guess, I wanted to start with is um, is something to do with the fact that Madison both helped to shape the institution of the presidency by the Constitution, and then, of course, had the opportunity later to be president himself. This makes him unique in a certain way. Um, so I, my first big question is, um, were Madison's views on the constitutional role of the president? Maybe as a second part to that, uh, did he live up to his own expectations of the presidency? Was he consistent as, as president? Was he consistent with his view of what the president's role in our constitutional system was? Anybody? Or ignore yeah. it? Joe, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt and let you uh, take a shot at it if you like. Okay, here, yeah, I'm, I'm foolish enough to throw the first uh, <laughs> few propositions out there. So, um, the dichotomy that Chris just pointed to, that Matt Madison's both a founder and a president, I think, is real attention in how we would understand Madison. So, 
um, Madison, as founder, really worried about legislative tyranny. And the Federalist Papers are pretty clear on this, that the legislative is the impetuous vortex that is swallowing up and sucking up all of the powers of government. And he based this on his experience in the 1780s when the state government set up weak executives and they got trampled on by the state legislatures. And so Madison's trying to set up a very strong and independent executive. Um, so he's very concerned as founder with spinning the presidency. Uh, from the executive, as he puts it in Federalist 51, the weird, um, and this is what makes historians scratch their heads, is that after the founding, Madison joins the House of Representatives, and he starts to talk a lot about executive tyranny and not legislative tyranny. Now, if you were a, a sort of cynical commentator on this, you would say, well, Madison be part of the legislature, and now all of a sudden the legislature looks really great to him. But I think if you read his work carefully, you see there's actually a real concern on Madison's part that the executive power is a dangerous power, is accumulating more power than the Constitution allots to it. And so his his main legacy as president, actually, is to be the, the first president to really stand against um, the aggrandizement of the powers of the executive. So Madison's legacy is he's the most solicitous of legislative power of all of the early presidents. E. Jefferson, who, in his thought and in, in his words, claimed to be really, you know, in favor of a restrained executive, and turns out to be a really, really powerful executive, and he really sort of blurs the line about constitutionality of power in the executive. Madison is sort of the first warden president uh, that we have, and yet he's actually the most restrained president. So, so in a way, there's a sort of development of his thought, but I think his as president are very consistent with his view of the president as a restrained executive and not a domineering one. I would, I would uh, the, the thing I would pick up on is, is the part about, I don't think that there's I a cynical interpretation of Madison as someone who's uh, between the 1780s and the 1790s, someone who's, who's uh, views are shifting. I'm not sure that they're shifting so much as now that the constitution's in place and working, we get experience. And we can say, okay, now in this system, we have this issue because he, he's watching um, Hamilton develop his, his program in the early 1790s and the sort of virtuosity with which Hamilton gets his, his, or plates his programs and pushes them through Congress in, 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 something, in a role that's described as, as somewhat uh, primesterial and sees that as a, an emergent danger. It's not that he's the idea that the legislature can be dangerous. It's, it's that he's a system that's in place and saying, okay, uh, the executive under the right circumstances, even the way we've constrained him, can be dangerous too. Yeah, that, I, I like the way, Joe, you framed it in the light of, both of you framed it in light of the circumstances that, that Matt finds himself in, whether it's in the 1790s or later in the early 1800s. And Kevin of Alexander Hamilton, uh, you, you heard the charge that Madison's just sort of a flip-flopper on things he's inconsistent, and that one of the things he's inconsistent on is his view of the president. In other words, um, I've, I've read that Madison and Hamilton believe that they had the same view on the executive, but they later uh, Madison changed his views on these things, or Alexander Hamilton changed his views on these things. I'm not sure this, but let me just throw a question out there. Did do you think Madison and Hamilton agree on the issues of the role of the executive? And the legislature, the limited powers, or the relationship with the branches. Well, this is maybe a bit of heresy in these circles to say that oh, I think in the Federalist Papers, um, I'm not entirely sure Madison and Hamilton had the same conception of the president. Hamilton writes most of the essays in the Federalist on the presidency from '67 to '77. Um, writes a few because of his work on the separation of powers. Um, in Federalist 48, 40, uh, and 51. And so Madison's talking about the president needing to be stronger to check the legislature. Hamilton's talking about the president needing to have energy um, in order to, to um, the execution of the laws. And so they both want a strong executive, but they want them for different reasons. Hamilton's really pu pushing energy as a leading character in Republican government, you have to have it in any form of government, including a Republican government. Matt admits that, but I think he's 
uh, he's a little bit less sure about how energetic he wants the president to be, even in, in the Federalist Papers. Uh, just because uh, later on, H Hamilton certainly thought that he had been betrayed. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case. I think that, that I don't know how heresy that is, because it, now that you pointed out, there is some ambiguity there. And, and when you look at uh, even uh, some of the earlier references to uh, energy, so the, 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 the reference to energetic government in Federalist 23, and it's not clear that that's going to be the executive at that point, but Hamilton. Uh, that's not Madison at that point. So now, uh, um, other uh, other references to to energy maybe in Federalist 37. But again, that's that reference in Federalist 37 to to energy in the federal government. Uh, and I believe that that's a Madison essay, but that's much more oblique. It's not uh, it's not a direct reference to energy in the executive. Uh, it, it's like I said, it's it's a much more indirect uh, reference to to energy generally and energy being a problem, lack of energy. Um, uh, being a problem. So that's interesting. I often uh, contrast um, uh, letters. One from Alexander Hamilton to James Duane. I'm sure you're familiar with, I think, mm -hmm. which is the 1780 letter, uh, 1781 letter, where he's saying we need energy, and he's clearly emphasized the need for energy in the executive. Was mentioning, right? You've got to get things done. And I have students cast that with James Madison's vices of the political system, where it becomes pretty clear that we need a more energetic government as well. But the purpose of that energy is to do a better job of securing rights. Is that a fair way of distinguishing between Hamilton and Madison's emphasis on the need for a, for energy in the executive? Or is that too simple? I mean, I think that, that it isn't careful. One can, can kind of overstate that and end up thinking that uh, Hamilton and Madison are fundamentally divergent about what government's about. I think you've got to be very careful about that, at least. Um, this is something that, that I don't know who could see what before we actually formally started, but something that, that Joe and I were talking about was uh, the, the fundamental agreement that they had ultimately on um, on what government is supposed to uh, supposed to do ultimately, in the end, that Steering rights is, is the basic goal for both. I mean, as much as Hamilton is maligned as a, a monarchist or an empire builder, he makes it clear over and over again, look, this is, uh, I have a conception uh, what uh, was thought of at the time as a strong conception of government and a, and a broad reading of the Constitution, but my goal in doing those things is to protect rights. Uh, and I think that does, I mean, that's certainly clear in Madison, but I think it gets overlooked uh, to extent in uh, Hamilton. Yeah, it's fair. I mean, this is a disagreement about executive power, which is really a disagreement about the means to an end that both shared, which is, is bringing liberty and individual rights and freedoms. Um, you know, one side sees a powerful executive as a, a good guarantee of that, and the other sees a powerful executive as a potential threat to that. So Madison being the leader, of course, um, being really much more fearful of executive power. But I uh, remember also one of the one of the Federalist papers that gets overlooked, uh, I think, in, in discussions of the executive uh, 69. Uh, Hamilton goes out of his way to say, look, this is not the British king. king. He have things like an absolute prerogative. He doesn't have unilateral war power. Um, he doesn't have the, un the unlimited ability to appoint ministers. So you know, he goes out of his way to say, when we're talking about a strong executive or a powerful executive, I think even Hamilton saying, look, there, there's a there's a, a, a range within which we can consider the executive's power, and the British king is outside of that range. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. That range more than then? Is it fair to say that, or, or of executive power would it be more limited, or is that again too simple of a way to think about it? I think it is, but I think the best that could never have been known in the 1780s based on, on the limiter of the questions they were asking, which is a strange thing to say because they were fundamental questions. But they were also sort of grand design as opposed to questions of implementation. And what Kevin pointed to earlier in our, our conversation about Hamilton having a sort of prime minister view of the presidency as Secretary of the Treasury, where he got this financial plan and he's sending all of these boards to Congress from the executive branch saying, this is what we need to do next. I have experience because I've, I've implemented these things in practice. That 
that's no question the Constitution really ever addresses is to what extent can the executive, you know, um, you know, recommending measures to Congress and having a veto power, to what extent can the can president take the leadership in legislative, uh, setting the legislative agenda? Hamilton takes that ambiguity in the 1990s and really runs with it, looking to try to really forge a connection between the executive and lawmaking. Um, and that sets a precedent, well, we have today, of course. Um, and the only really among the early presidents to, to really restrain himself in that respect I uh, could say John Adams did a did a decent job of that. James Madison was the was the per really said, I'm going to let the Congress develop its own agenda and implement its own agenda. Jefferson certainly did not. I mean, Jefferson wrote bills, sent them to Congress, and said, uh, you rewrite these in someone else's hands so that I might not be seen as executive as meddling into the affairs of the legislature. Right. You wrote the bill for crying out loud and said right. it over there. And that's so, the kind of th- and that's the kind of thing that Congress throughout the 19th century rebelled against. They're, they're very uh, particular. I mean, for, for all of uh, for all of the accusations about his expansion of executive power, um, did that ex- exactly once. Uh, it was a compensated emancipation bill, and it, it didn't go anywhere. Uh, but but it's fascinating that you bring that up. That Madison essentially sort of pioneers what eventually becomes the Whig Party doctrine on the presidency, which is that the, the president shouldn't get involved in the legislative process and the veto is there merely as a check against haste or, or haste or gross un- unconstitutionality. Yeah, but I think the, the, the sort of the proto-Whig, that is the proto-Whig, is his presidential legacy. And he would have expected Jefferson to play that role, and he didn't. Um, so in a way, Madison's legacy as president is seen in Congress. Seen in the fact that Henry Clay becomes a powerful speaker of the House at this time, the first powerful speaker of the House, and you get things like standing committees in the, in the Congress that can actually deal with legislation on their own instead of waiting on the Secretary of the Treasury to send a report over or the President to send a bill over. The, the development of Congress's own capacity as an institution happens during the Madisonian presidency, and so I think Madison would love that that's part of his legacy. I think that that. He would do that as part of a constitutional legacy that he would be proud of. So the, the idea of Madison as a pro wig. I don't know if anybody's developed that in writing, but that would be a great. That would be really to, to really useful to people. Um, I have a speaking of Jefferson. You brought Jefferson up again, and I think Joe, it was you earlier who mentioned that Jefferson gained an executive power. Uh, Dave wants to know how, given I think given their 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 personal relationship or their close even political relationship. How can reconcile Jefferson's expanded presidency with the understanding of a weak or weaker executive? Since Madison, hmm. he calls him Jefferson's protege. I think maybe you also want to tackle that. <laughs> you have to be very careful, and, and I'm not. Uh, uh, I th- in this group, I'm not the uh, the, the strongest uh, Madison supporters, but I think it's unfair to Madison to simply say that he was. was uh, running around doing Jefferson's bidding. I mean, there's 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 probably some of that. Sometimes very reluctantly, as in the case of the, the Helvidius essays in, in 1793. But uh, but Madison's look, Madison's well established as a, as an independent thinker and as a force in his own right, not simply as uh, not not simply as as Jefferson's toady. I mean, he develops um, he develops. Theory, new theories about separation of powers. He develops theories about parties, uh, the extended sphere, which is an absolutely unique uh, contribution to uh, to political science, and all of that happens. Um, all of that happens outside of, of the influence of Jefferson. Much of that happens while Jefferson is, is overseas and, and uh, largely incommunicado. So. Yeah, that's good. It's a great question. I, I don't know of anything that Madison writes addressing the incon consistency between Jefferson's arguments about executive power and his practice of executive power. Of course, Madison's partially responsible for the embargo, which is, I, it's been named, and I'm not sure I disagree with it, that, that the embargo is the most sweeping delegation of power to the executive in American history, um, where basically the Army and the Navy are, are, are put in the position of confronting American citizens and um, you know, confiscating property and this kind of thing. Matt's partially responsible for that as well, of course, because uh, he's in the administration. So 
I'm not aware of Madison ever trying to reconcile Jefferson's practice and his thought. I think Jefferson's own practice shows that he he, he think Jefferson followed his principle adequately as president, but I'm not sure Madison ever said anything about that. Yeah, but makes that interesting, Joe. Is is, is uh, my sense is that, that of course Je- Je- Jefferson acted in his own mind according to his own mind as president, but he, he my understanding is that he relied on Madison's advice very heavily. This is all playing off this idea that that is simply Jeff- Jefferson's protege. Ma- Ma- um, my understanding is that Jefferson did very little as president without consulting Madison first. Um, it, it's interesting, and I, you know, this may, may be back the idea that you brought up earlier. You, I'm not sure, Joe or Kevin, I'm not sure you brought this up. That the that the, the thing for Jefferson or for Jefferson here was that, that it not appears as though the executive be meddling too much in legislative affairs. Mm-hmm. They go about this. Uh, the executive's got to have the power to do certain things. And really, deal with the kinds of issues that we're dealing with with the British and Prime interfering in trade, all these other sorts of things. That requires, given the circumstances, something like this sweeping uh, grant of power to, uh, to the embargo. But, but the, I think Madison may have been able to do it in a way that, that didn't appear as though it was an aggrandizement of executive power beyond necessary. Those are some good qualifications to think of what we're saying here. Um, and so to try to be fair to Jefferson, we could say something like the following. One is Congress passed the Embargo Act. Jefferson executed it, implemented it. Um, and that as much as I sort of mocked Jefferson for this practice of writing a bill, sending it over to Congress, and then having somebody rewrite it so it didn't appear that he'd done that, um, that's a lot different than the way presidents currently lead the legislative process, in which they just openly say, I'm responsible for all of this legislation, whether it's tax cuts or whether it's the Affordable Care Act. We call them the president's law, not, not, not Congress's. At least Jefferson maintained the position that the president wasn't responsible for this, even if he was doing this behind the scenes. So scholars call this the hidden hand presidency, where you're sort of hiding behind the scenes, implementing legislation and, and ex- exerting leadership. So at least that's different because the, the American people see this as still a legislative branch that's independent of the executive. And Jefferson maintained that position uh, through his through his soul, you know, maneuvering behind the scenes. One of the things that we asked people to read for today was this uh, newspaper editorial by James Madison called Parties, which was published in 1792, which I think, in which I think Madison's point is, look, we're going to have political parties. They're unavoidable. But let's not multiply them artificially. Let's let parties, to the extent that they're, that they're inevitable, let's let them sort of evolve or emerge along natural lines. Uh, and, and, and then mitigate the influence of these parties by allowing them to be mixed against each other. But what effect do you, do you think that the emergence of parties had on the office of the presidency? Because, again, when they're drafting the Constitution, the Constitution, there's no mention of parties to knowledge in, in the debates at the convention. Um, does the emergence of parties shape? Maybe maybe the emergence of parties plays a difference in how, say, somebody like Washington, the office of the presidency versus Jefferson and Madison later. Does that influence their their executive um, role? It's, I think we should be careful at the outset, too, to make sure we're, we're clear that the, the parties that we're talking about in the 1790s uh, bear very little sort of structural relation to the parties that will emerge in the Jacksonian period and then, and then going forward. Uh, there are very uh, top-down organizations that didn't necessarily – the organization didn't penetrate to the lower levels of society in, in the way that it did – uh, nomination of presidents was, at least among the Jeffersonians, done primarily by caucus rather than by either convention or by primary. Um, but I, I don't see a lot of evidence that uh, presidents during this period, whether it was Washington or Madison, saw themselves as party leaders in the way that uh, presidents understood them or were understood as party leaders from the 1830s or 40s forward, even to today. With that, I think. There's weird contrast in theory and practice with regard to the presidency and parties during this period. So 
Most of the presidents want to say they're above party, that the president is the one office that's got to stay above the fray, that's got to be representing the whole country, you're the chief executive for the whole nation, you're not representing a party. So there's this sort of unspoken premise that presidents are above parties, outside of them. Only Washington really practices this. And even then, his administration doesn't stay above the fray. His administration gets involved in legislative politics. Jeffers, of course, gets involved in legislative politics. And then Madison, while he's out of legislative politics, uh, there are still really important party developments that affect Madison's presidency in the most fundamental way. It's exactly what Kevin just described, that, that nominations went through the Congressional Caucus for the president. And so Madison's uh, renomination in 1812, historians generally conclude that Madison had asked for war in 1812 in order to be renominated by the Congress. Congress, all of the war hawks in Congress. And so Congress taking upon itself the power of nominating presidential candidates, just the usurpation of the separation of powers, right? That the president is now independent of the legislature, not selected by the legislature. The Congressional Caucus actually makes the president dependent on Congress. And then, as generally assumed, uh, was dragged reluctantly into war by the Congress because he had been renominated in 1812 and Congress had that power in its hands. And one other thing I would add is that uh, the other side of being a party leader for a president that we now regularly recognize today, which is not necessarily legislative politics, but electoral politics, uh, the, the precedent that was set that, that the president stayed out of active involvement in that, that doesn't really go away until the 1930s um, when, when Roosevelt begins to take an active hand in, in, in trying to select who are going to be Democratic nominees and, and getting involved in that uh, in, in that process. Uh, presidential nominees uh, largely stayed out of that. Uh, there are probably exceptions. Stephen Douglas in 1860 actively campaigned as a Democrat, although more for himself nationally than for, for no Democratic candidates. But uh, staying out staying out of electoral politics, I think, was 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 also a significant difference. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I had a thought. I had not thought about that. I guess I assumed. I've always assumed that they were willing to be influence through uh, through the executive um, on electoral politics because we know that these frequently, including Jefferson's, right, which led to the the famous Marbury v. Madison case. Uh, the eventual appointments were often done along, along party lines. Appointments, yes, and the people that they appointed. Uh, often surrogates, but when you when you look at somebody who's nominated for the, for the office of, of president, uh, someone who's who's king in that way, whether sitting or not, uh, they tend. I mean, in in the early period, uh, I think the Washington model was more accurate. They stand for office rather than run for it. Uh, but then throughout the 19th century, uh, they're running, but they're not running, which is to say. Uh, in Give an example that I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with. Uh, Lincoln in 1860, after he gets nominated, he's never heard from again. He may as well be in a cave, not get involved in the political process. And it was considered a bad form for potential nominees to get involved in that process. I see. I see. Interesting. I think that's something, by the way, Madison would, would clearly agree with. I think he, that was the way he was in his own election. Uh, I, I, I know. <laughs> Matt was in favor of electoral reform from a very early time. It's I, I, always interesting to go back and look at um, at Matt's early political career because there were several things about it. not not only as we were saying earlier that Madison is not simply you know um, the um, the uh, what do you call the apprentice of Jefferson. Madison is a Madison is an expert politician in his own right from a very early age, mm -hmm. and he uh, he serves. Three, I think it's three years on the executive council. How he and, uh, first with Patrick Henry, I believe, in, in Virginia, and then with uh, with Thomas Jefferson. So Madison's a certain term in the Virginia legislature, and then he loses an election because the you know what later calls the vicious arts of electioneering. Right? People are getting he loses to a candidate, and I think it's in Orange County. He loses to another candidate who is out there actively campaigning and buying. And you know, providing hogs and things like that, and Madison never forgets that. Uh, it was and when he himself would never engage in that. He thought that that was somehow wrong about um, getting to 
But on the point that I raised, I'm sorry I'm all over the place here, on the other point mm-hmm. that I raised, Madison, Madison has quite a bit of executive experience um, because he served three years on the executive council in the state of Virginia. And he's on the executive council. One of his chief complaints, to go back kind of where, to where we started, one of his chief complaints is the, the, the executive in Virginia actually has very little power. Um, and so even at that early stage, Madison thinks the, the government ought to have a little more influence in politics, even on the state level. Um, so, but again, I, I, what I find, always find interesting about Madison is it seems as though he's always trying to strike a balance in things. It's though he wants the executive to dominate, he has to be a little more executive influence as a way to balance out the things that we were bringing up earlier. Right, legislative potential for legislative tyranny. There's always lots of things here somewhere. So yeah, I think that's right. I mean, um, so you know, the charge about flip flopping that the Madison was a flip flopper. Um, it's only true if it's flip flopping to say you're steering ship one way, and an obstacle on the left, you steer it right, and then when an obstacle appears on the right, you turn left and steer from that. Well, you're flip flopping. You should have just stayed right. Because instead of, you know, you've changed your mind. Well, you changed your mind because circumstances changed and the direction you needed to go changed. That, that, that's really the balance here. Madison's striking uh, has to do with sometimes the executive becomes more powerful and you have to be more wary of the executive. Sometimes it's the legislature. And, you know, referring to the executive experience, really what's most formative for Madison on the executive level is his experience in the Articles of Confederation. Which, because there is no executive, that's all executive experience. And he's extremely frustrated with the lack of a competent executive under the Articles of Confederation. So I think that's that's probably as formative of fix for him as any other. Quite frequently, his frustration at the committee system of, of trying Congress, right? In fact, I believe it's in weeks of the, rat- the formal official ratification of the, of the Articles versus operating under the Articles unofficially as though they've been ratified for some time. When they finally ratify and they officially go into effect, I think weeks later Madison starts calling for amendments. Uh, one is to change the quorum requirement to get things done. One is we've got to find a better way to do these get things done than this committee system. Pretend to be executives. I mean that's actually a, a Antonian phrase that Madison himself uses, right? I mean the supposed flip-flopping begins. I mean, if you go back and and look at the Federalists, um, in order to the, the, the idea of balance that Joe talked about and that, that you mentioned uh, is, is absolutely vital to understanding the, the theory of separation of powers that he develops in the Federalists. That is to say, the thing doesn't work unless the branches are not only separate but co-equal, or, or at least close enough to being co-equal that one can't uh, easily overwhelm the other. And, and so the idea that, that, that one branch could, could could dominate, whether it's the legislative or the executive or the judiciary, uh, was extremely problematic. And so this is why he goes to such great lengths in places like uh, Federalist uh, 48 and 51 to say, look, the executive's a problem, uh, the, the lack of executive power is a problem, Problem, we beef this thing up, and so we're going to unify the executive and so on. But we're also going to split the legislature in two in order to to, to bring about um, some kind of balance. And creating his experience during the Articles of Confederation, you see that during in vices of the political system of the United States, there are eleven points that he addresses uh, he, that he that he spends some time arguing about, and at, at least the first seven are primarily concerned with executive. And the problems of the executive and, and the execution of the laws under the article. Yeah, that's a good. That's a great connection. Um, a, a question of flip flop. Just sort of I'm going to act this kind of into the middle of our conversation about Madison's view and his presidency. One of the from some of the other readings that we asked people to look at, uh, the Virginia resolutions and then a later letter to Nicholas Trist. Um, this is off topic from what we were talking about, but but Anne is often accused of flip flopping on this question of balance, uh, especially with regard to national power versus state 
power. Because go back to 1787, it, what you find is exactly as you were pointing out, Kevin, and this is peace and other things. Matt's calling for, for a pretty significant shift of power away from the states toward the national government. Uh, in the 1790s, especially late 1790s, Alien and Sedition Acts, Madison authors the Virginia Resolutions, what you find there is something in assertion for state powers. It seems that now he's putting the emphasis on the, on, the, on the importance of the states in our federal system to create national power. And then forward, emergence of the arguments for nullification and secession, and you find Madison really argue against the idea that the states have the right to, um, to nullify and secede and these sorts of things. And that's the reason why why Madison has sometimes been accused of being inconsistent in his views. But but if you if you understand his purposes in each of his, in light of the circumstances, it, it, it kind of suggests that Madison's being consistent in that matters most is this kind of balance, balancing of things, whether balancing of proper of power in the national and the state governments or, or proper of power between the, uh, the three branches on the national level. Um, some just give, give has happened. There's got a little more give and take here, or we need a little more push against the legislature, or a little bit more pushback against the executive. It seems like Madison's actually fairly consistent in that. But that that that's that kind of thing, if you will. I can't think of a better term at this point. It seems to be one of we might consider him a statesman because that's something we consider statesmen to do, right? To sort if the, the, the change the course of the ship, as we were saying earlier, in light of what you know, what lies ahead, or what rocks are ahead, or these sorts of things. So, um, uh, one other point, Kevin, in, in light of what you were saying, you know, there's a reason Madison talks a lot about checks and balances in Federalist 51, right? For balances they often we have a tendency to say checks and balances as though that's all one word, right? Three words condensed into one thing, checks and balances. But for us, and they were the two different things, both of which were absolutely necessary. So that allows a branch to stop some other action of another branch. But this means you've got to, you've got to consider, for example, the legislative branch is naturally the most powerful. You've got to, you've got to balance that branch against the others by strengthening the others and weakening the legislative branch. And you know, permanent way, although there's a permanent way to do it by saying enumerating the powers of Congress or the powers of the executive a little less defined, what the actual balance will look like in practice, it seems to me, will depend on on what's going on at any particular moment. Yeah, I think that, and again, I, I'm not sure how much of what John and I were talking about before we formally started was 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 picked up a larger audience, but. I think that what you see in 1798 is sort of symptomatic of the politics of the 1790s, where, where one, one thing more than anything else, I think that, that by 1787, the founders had not figured out was uh, do you uh, be legitimate or loyal opposition in a republic? And this was saying, I don't think that... And you know, looking at the ancient republics and thinkers on republics, I don't, I don't anybody had figured this out. And this doesn't mean, by the way, that, that Madison was dumb or Jefferson or Washington. What it means is that statesmanship is really hard. And there are things that you can, you can figure out lots of things and just have this gap, this massive gap. And no one had figured out, no one prominent had figured out that there's a difference between a faction and a party. And so all these, these groups are looking at each other, the, the Federalists and the Republicans saying, they're a faction, and because they're opposed to us, they're Francophiles, they're Anglophiles, they're uh, monarchists, they're Jacobins, and and so they're, they're not able to to sort out that. Wait a minute, we agree on policy, but we're basically in agreement on principle. In other words, they hadn't figured out the kind of of party conflict with broad framework of of agreement on fundamental purpose that had become the norm by the 1840s. Uh, and so, and the idea that you could that you have opposition, uh, be opposition, um, you know, Madison kind of figures it out, out emotionally in Federalist Ten, where he talks about the fact that look, you can't make everybody the same, you can't give everybody the same opinion, but 
not until Je- you don't see until Jefferson's first inaugural in 1801, where he says we're we're all Republicans, we're all Federalists, we're all working on the same page. Ultimately, that this idea that you can have dissent and that that dissent is uh, legitimate. And so, what Madison, and this is a long way of saying that what Madison and, and Jefferson see by 1798 is, oh my God, these these Federalists are going to uh, crush all dissent and make us into a little Britain and. and this is the only way we have to resist. The ordinary electoral process, they didn't quite recognize that yet as the solution. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's what we have at this point, I think, just to maybe try to pan out and, and see where our conversation is gone, are three um, paradoxes having to do with balance that Madison, as a statesman, tried to address. The first is how do you balance legislative power and executive power? And Madison at times is saying we need a stronger executive, and at times he's saying we need to have the executive back off. But that's something to do with his adjustment to circumstances and need to con- continue balance. The second uh, uh, balancing act he has to, he has to you know, carry is between the national and the state governments. He's a federalist during the time of the founding, in which case he's really in favor of strengthening the national government, and then you get the Virginia Resolutions 10 years later, which is about the national government becoming too strong, and the state governments needing to sort of organize to oppose, to interpose, whatever that means. And then the third balancing act, which is the one we're talking about right now, has with the nature of disagreement and parties and elections and how political electioneering and how these contests are going to be carried out. Um, and so Kevin's absolutely right. Jefferson and we don't know what the boundaries are until 1800 when we finally have a peaceful transition of power. And Jefferson famously says, right, every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. If we can have differences of opinions, we can be different shades of the same thing as long as we don't disagree in principle. The first course is, how do you define what the difference is between a difference of opinion versus a difference of principle? That's something that the founders really couldn't define for us, and we still argue about today. So the thing, I mean, we could address all three of these. We've addressed the first of those three balancing acts pretty pretty thoroughly. I'm really interested. So if I, I'm going to pose a question to Kevin because I've understood <laughs> this one properly. Um, how do you understand the Virginia Resolutions? Uh, the interposition, what does it mean to organize the state governments to interpose? What does Madison have in mind? And the second part of the Virginia Resolutions I don't understand is what about compact and the parties to the compact and that the states are the parties to the compact because my understanding generally is that the people are the parties to the compact that creates the Constitution. We the people and not we the states. And so what is this? In, can you maybe explain probably to others here what, what kind of compact Madison is envisioning, what role the states play in that compact, and then what does he mean by interposition? And don't answer any of those if you think those are, those are impossible questions to answer, which they might be. <laughs> oh, no, no problem, right off the top of my head. Uh, so the, taking the second one first, because I got I got distracted a little, little bit um, by, the, by the second one, eh, maybe both at once, but uh, this is actually, it turns out in 1798 to be a much more careful writer than Jefferson and much less prone to getting carried away with himself. If you, if you uh, compare the Kentucky and, and the Virginia resolutions, um, Jefferson is much more of, oh, yeah, null and void, no effect. And uh, he, he gets much closer to, uh, and I think this, was, this is sort of classic Jefferson in this sense, gets much closer to, well, you know what? Sometimes you need a revolution. And you never get that from Madison. Yeah, just to interject there, sorry to interrupt, but just no, to no, draw no. to the, the letter to Trist, he says, at the bottom of that page that I have here printed out, the Kentucky resolutions being less guarded and more easily perverted. Right? That you're right, that Jefferson didn't restrain himself the way that Madison did in his Virginia resolution. Right, and that was, I think that was part of Jefferson's ongoing belief and the problems that he was having in the 1990s and maybe later with the idea that you don't, republics don't require constant revolution or periodic revolution. This is famous statements that are um, taken, you know, maybe out of context, but but I think they're reflective of the problems that, that um, the problems that Jefferson and others had about how do you 
how, how do you have disagreement and not have it be revolution, not have it lead to revolution? And how can you have disagreements and not have them be factions? Um, retrospectively, the Trist Law is just one example, but there's a small library, and, I'm, and Joe, I'm sure you're well aware of, of many of these things, where uh, Madison addresses retrospectively during the nullification crisis and after, you know, what I mean. So, so things like the essay on sovereignty. Uh, one of my favorites is the, the letter to Edward Everett. And is, is able to make great, uh, is able a lot with the fact that uh, he, he never says that interposition means nullification. It always, for, for, for Madison, it always means something less than that, something of state governments cooperating in order to arouse public opinion to, to uh, about electoral change at the federal level, which will reverse something like the, like the like Sedition Act. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when you're talking about compact, he, he also uh, is able to go back to the Virginia resolutions, and this is a huge difference with the Kentucky resolutions, and say, this is not a compact between state governments. It's a compact between the people acting through the instrumentalities of states. But the fundamental compact is is between people. This is, I do this with my Constitution students, and, and they do too. This is a huge difference between the Constitution and the Articles. Who writes the Articles? Well, the state legislatures. Who writes the Constitution? Well, the people of those states. So the people of the state of Michigan, where I'm sitting right now, ratified both the U.S. Constitution and the Michigan Constitution. And so you have true divided sovereignty because the, the, the origin of power is the same in both cases. Hmm. Okay. That's really interesting. That's good. If you don't mind, just want to connect that then to the question that was just posed about Madison in 1812, because so I just made between what Kevin said about the Virginia Resolutions and imposition, and then Madison's presidency. So one of the famous episodes in Madison's presidency is um, during the War of 1812, he faces a lot, he has very little in the way of a standing army or a navy, something like 7,000 troops. Um, so completely unprepared for war in terms of a standing army, which if you look at his first inaugural address, he praises that we don't have a very large standing army. Um, but then he has to rely on, of course, our state militias. And so it's to ask the governors to participate in the calling out of the state militias and the placing of them under the chief executive's leadership in two states, Connecticut and Massachusetts, governors there say no in some shape or form. They call up the militia, but they want to keep control over it or refuse to let the national government take it over. And so it um, doesn't really interfere too strongly with the state's not alliance with that request. He does a few things. He refuses to fund them and that sort of thing. Um, can't imagine a Lincoln, you know, sort of having hands off approach to that kind of opposition. And so the interposition means something like when the states have to carry out some things that the federal government wants to do, if the states think that it's illegitimate, the government needs to let the states um, have that role in carrying out the law. So, um, that the state governments and the national governments are partners in carrying out much of the law, and so Madison lets the states oppose to some extent the, the war effort, which is really remarkable when you think about it. And no other president that I'm aware of has ever taken that kind of a stance. Um, and so maybe part of what he was thinking about was the Virginia Revol- resolutions at the time, that he had said interposition is legitimate, and now here's interposition, and so maybe I should this thing play out. Yeah. That's Joe. That's that's I think of imposition it is is the idea that the states, the national government, still relies very heavily on the states for any kind of administrative functions or, or execution of laws on the local level, state and local level. So imposition for me means something like dragging their heels. It means it doesn't necessarily mean. We're, Madison says we're not we're not declaring this law null and void, but insofar as it relies on the state. Uh, this, to implement this law, we're going to draw this thing out. We, you know, you know who who's going to be arrested? How are you going to deal with people that are arrested for violating the Alien and Sedition Acts? Right? Well, they're arrested by local officials. They're going to be held in jails. They're going to be transferred. You can do a lot to drag these things out. And interestingly enough, this reminds me of something that Madison brought up at the Constitutional Convention, where they're talking about being a fugitive slave. Law guarantee for returning slaves. If you look at the final language in the Constitution about the slave clause, 
it, to get a slave returned, the language of the Constitution, it, it is entirely incumbent on the person who is trying to reclaim that slave to go appeal to the authorities of the state where the slave has fled to to get them back, which means they have to file a suit in that state. It can do the courts for years, and it can be drug out and out and on and on and on. Right. Right? So, and Weston yeah. mentions that. that that invention that that, um, that you have a lot of control over the, in the future of slaves. So I, I, that's what I think this means. And, uh, is interpose means delay, drag heels. And at the same time, as Kevin was saying, sound the general alarm and try to get the states to cooperate with each other, and also trying to get this law overturned eventually through elections. And yeah, the way I'm sorry, I didn't mean to 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 but. The way that you're describing it makes it sound very much like a federal state version, a sort of an application to federalism of the theory of separation of powers and the role of the branches that you get, say, in Jackson's veto on the bank message. Where it's, this is not about us attempting to trench on the federal government's power, but say that, look, in, in a system of divided sovereignty, we power too. And in our legitimate sphere, we're going to exercise that power. And Madison makes clear in, say, Feder Federalist 45, he says, look, very responsibility for order, improvement, prosperity, life, liberty, property, that rests with the states. And so we're within that sphere, we have that power. And so we're going to, to use it. Uh, just like uh, Jackson says that, look, I'm the president. To the extent that the president has power over legislation, I'm going to use it. It doesn't matter to me that the, the courts have declared the bank to be constitutional, that Congress believes the bank to be constitutional. I think it's not. Now, it doesn't mean I can just go board it up. It does mean that, that to the extent that I have power to influence it, in this case, the veto power, I'm entirely on my own, uh, on my own authority and in my own independent authority to use it. Interesting. Here's a point to drive this home in light of Madison's own thought. As a constitutional convention, Madison in, in the Virginia plan initially wanted a coercive power in the national government to compel states, non-client states, right, to acts of, you know, taxes and resolutions or whatever else. The coercive power there, but in the end that was taken out and got direct election of, of, of the House of Representatives and uh, proportional representation. So Madison took the coercive power out. And I guess what that suggests to me is that um, uh, 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 the, 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 the at least one branch of Congress is directly democratically elected, and people instead of the states. That complicates things. It's harder somehow. Uh, how am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> how it makes it matter as to how whether or not states are simply subordinate to the national government, or uh, whether there's some. some Ability, there's some ground for the states to be resistant to, to, to certain acts of national legislation. It's a confusing thing. I'm confusing no, no, I, I think I, I, maybe, maybe if I pointed us more in the direction of the executive and the judiciary and, and a little bit away from the legislature, um, one of the reasons that it ceased to become necessary to have that per, to enforce state compliance was because, was because the federal government under the Constitution would now be equipped with its own executive and its own judiciary so that they weren't reliant on the state governments to comply with the requisitions of the federal government. If, if the federal government enacted a tax or levied troops or whatever it was, they could now enforce and adjudicate those laws themselves. They don't need the apparatus of the state government in order to, uh, order to implement federal policy. So to the extent that, that Madison... Um, to the extent that Madison was sort of hamstrung by the governors of Massachusetts and Connecticut um, had to do with the fact that, that I think he was sort of proud of that small army, as Joe mentions, and, and uh, reticent to want to expand it in case of necessity. Yes, yeah, in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton calls it the great and radical vice of the article, that it can only operate on the states. And then the states to carry out its orders and its laws, as opposed to operating directly on on, on citizens themselves. But this is a really thorny issue. 
Um, I mean, look at recent events in Kentucky, right? We're talking about, you know, the federal government then enforcing its law. Can the states and local officials oppose that? Um, and this is why, you know, the ambiguity in the Virginia resolutions I find so troubling. So let me just quote one sentence from the Virginia resolutions after he lays out the terms of the compact, the parties to it, and he made a big deal of that in the letter to Trist, that it's plural parties. It's one party. I'm not totally sure what he means by that. And then he lays out the unconstitutionality of the Alien and Sedition Acts. He says towards the end, and this is the, a quote from the Virginia Resolutions, um, we solely appeal to like dispositions of the other states that the aforesaid are unconstitutional and necessary and proper measures will be taken by each state for cooperating with this state and maintaining under the authority, rights, and liberties reserved to the states or the people. Feeling the amendment, right? What are the necessary and proper measures? It's it's totally unclear to me what these necessary and proper measures are. Um, and that then that becomes very tricky, right? What can the state and local governments do to maintain their powers in the face of a national government, which now has federal marshals and federal uh, courts in these districts to enforce federal law. In connection with what's going on today. And it's, tie, it's tied to one of the questions that was submitted about um, how the question is, how do the panel, what do the panelists think matters with the judicial branch in particular, empowering uh, states in the current day issue of same-sex marriage? Uh, I personally uh, know specifically about the role of the judicial branch, but this point you're raising, Joe, is really interesting. It's messy. It's not clear. It's not spelled out in the Constitution. So, with Madison, is Madison's lesson for us that, that this can be resolved in a, a yeah, um, I'm looking for? You have to feel your way through this somehow. Or, yeah, in in a political process. Political process. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think this is pretty clear in the federal papers, and I think the Virginia resolutions is an attempt to avoid put a legal marker and continuing to leave it open politically, ambiguously, as to what is going to be done. So, um, you know, this paper is pretty clear in several different essays. 46 comes to mind, but there are a few others where, well, what happens if the federal government oversteps its boundaries? What states do? And he says they'll coordinate and sound a general alarm, and that's, you know, organize. He never says exactly in the federal papers, and he doesn't do it here in the Virginia Resolution what will actually happen because I think he wants to leave that open for political judgment wrong. Um, but the then becomes, if you don't set up a legal check and balance, like he's done in so many other contexts, and if you just leave it open to politics, well, you haven't been a tool to the states and the local governments. You've just said, well, you know, organize and then work it out amongst yourselves. But what powers have you given them to oppose? Um, that question I think you would raise to Madison. That's very interesting. This is this is really tied to a question that was submitted at the beginning of our conversation. I want to kind of go back to this. Um, I'm go back to it. It'll take us a little off track of where we're at now, but it's a big question. Um, would Madison think a, a, that the president is too powerful, are too powerful? Are they powerful? Is one more powerful? Too much? Things that, that you've just been mentioning, Joe. I'll answer this one oh, first. Oh, thanks. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I've got about five different ways I would approach it swirling around in my head right now. I mean, the first thing that I think the first thing that would leap out of him, at, uh, leap out at Madison, I mean, forget about uh, presidency and, and uh, Chris and what their relative positions are, is to, to be what the hell happened to government by consent in this country. The overarching problem here is that, that most of the policy that's made has nothing to do with any of these elected branches and is, is done in this, in, in this uh, system that is specifically designed to deny, uh, to, to reject and deny government by consent. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, whatever whatever you think of um, cap and trade, your carbon emission legislation, that failed. Congress in 2009 and was one of the things that led to the change of power in the House of Representatives in 2010. And you're getting it anyway, in form, whether you like it or not. And, and so 
this vast apparatus that we have that has nothing at all to do with the Constitution, with consensual government, with, with uh, any of that, uh, is now, I think, um, beyond President or Congress, the dominant sort of, sort of feature of how the federal government works today. And I think that would be utterly appalling. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's uh, – I don't find anything to disagree with there. Um, maybe what I would say is – on domestic policy, I'm not sure about the answer to the question. <laughs> on foreign policy, I think Madison would be very uh, – I'm pretty convinced that Madison would think the president is way too powerful. Yeah. So, um, you know, sort of the standing army question, which Madison is very clear about in, in his first inaugural address. Right? He says – let me just quote from it. Uh, an, an armed and trained militia is the firmest bulwark of republics. Without standing armies, their liberty can never be in danger. No one's safe. Right. Large standing armies, you cannot have safety in a republic, um, and especially because it allows the executive to just send people around all over the place to exert power everywhere. And um, Madison, there's another war that Madison fights, I and mean, everyone knows about 1812. It's a congressionally declared war, and it's through um, a very limited sort of uh, executive. But in a sense, Madison doesn't have a limited executive role in the second war, which is the second Barbary War. So actually successfully prosecutes a war against the Barbary pirates uh, in 1815. Congress grants the authority not to declare war on them, but to send a navy over there. Um, it's very successful. Stephen Decatur makes a great name for himself. And the, the practice of the Barbary pirates getting tribute from us ends with Madison. Jefferson doesn't do it. The previous president don't they end up having to pay a lot of tribute and it's embarrassing actually what happens to the US Navy in some of these engagements and Madison's the one who ends that so but Madison still does it on the basis of a congressional authorization and it's very precise and says this is the purpose and this is what you get and here's how you can use it and that's just not the way that foreign policy works today and I think Madison's first inaugural sets forth a very different vision Joker first submitted a question she wanted to know um, uh, what do you think about Madison's leadership in the War of 1812? And then her question goes, let me see if I can find it. Um, Madison expands the role of the presidency beyond the power he originally thought the president should have, I'm assuming his role in 1812. Are you, would you, are you suggesting that the answer is no? Yeah. But maybe a little bit in the Second Barbary War or no? during the second Barbary War. Yeah, I, I think the answer is actually a pretty resounding no, and this is the noble contribution Madison makes. Um, so Madison gets beat up a little bit by historians on his presidency, and clearly the Capitol burned, uh, the White House. <laughs> they burned the Capitol, the, the, the Capitol of the nation during the War of 1812. It was somewhat of a military disaster. And so historians tend to beat up Madison um, um, in preparation for this um, I jotted, I took a quick survey of the historian's rankings of the Madison presidency. And um, the, the is anywhere from the sixth greatest president to the 20th. <laughs> the average ranking that he's been by historians is 13. Um, but it's great. And historians tend to say he was a pretty ineffective president. He was weak. Um, but I would say he was principled. He was he was drained, not weak. And so the great legacy he leaves us is a wartime president who exerts authority granted by Congress, but then is restrained in how that authority is used and doesn't um, try to push for more authority because we're in some crisis or emergency and you need to give it to the president. Aubrey uh, Adams, as you know, is, is, is responsible for a really scathing account of, of, of Madison's presidency, and especially his wartime leadership. Uh, or his, or his um, <laughs> maneuvering Congress in, uh, into in first granting author or declaring war, right? right? Which, was, which Adams, I think, suggested had been unwarranted. But then he, he really is responsible, I think, for kicking off this, this criticism of Madison as a failed president. So we're familiar with what Madison did, though, in, in foreign policy, especially in dealing with the British of 1812, and then, as you mentioned, Joe, the Barbary War. Why do you not know anything about Matt? Why do people typically not know anything about Madison's domestic policies as president? Hmm. 
Um, uh, want to answer that one? <laughs> no, the, the only thing I the only thing I would say about it, and and this might be a, a gross oversimplification, is that um, the foreign policy issues from the outbreak of the French Revolution until the end of the War of 1812, foreign policy issues absolutely dominated uh, American politics. I think to a, to a much greater extent than um, than, than might recognize. I mean, the, the issues of, of the French Revolution, uh, problems with the British, the, and the, 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 the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, and where Americans were on that. It's really not until the conclusion of, of uh, the War of 1812 that uh, America just kind of kind of looks inward and westward rather than looking east across the Atlantic to to Europe. And so this is a very, if you if you look at all of the the, the stirred history. They tend to mark 1815 as, uh, and the, the series of histories, they tend to mark 1815 as a turning point where why America shifted its focus from uh, international politics to domestic politics. And that, I mean, and so most of Madison's presidency is enclosed within that first year. Okay. And the veto, his use of the veto to veto especially internal improvements towards the end of his presidency is often cited as kind of one of the main legacies there. Um, and uh, that really, I mean, he lets the Congress do what it does in terms of legislation. He doesn't try to lead the process. So part of the reason why he's not considered a great domestic policy president is because I think he, the president's job wasn't to be the leader of, of the domestic policymaking process, to, to lead the legislative process. So um, but I think in a way, again, he would he would be proud of his restraint. Uh, legacy of what he did to restrain the power of the executive. You know, some people find that idealistic. Some people think that's not sufficiently realistic, that we need a powerful president to go around and do things. And so that's the, those are the kinds of people that pass very critical judgment of Madison. I, if you want a great, I'm sorry, I don't mean to jump in again, but if you want a great sort of one short document that shows this turn, not just in America, but in Madison, uh, take a look at his seventh annual message in 1815. It really you see you see the change in emphasis because the the, uh, um, the message is about basically he lays out the issues that are going to dominate American politics during what's referred to for better or worse as the second party system. It's about internal improvements. It's about banking. It's about tariffs. In other words, those those issues, and he doesn't fall into either what will become the Whig or Jacksonian camp. As a whole, but but those are the issues, and that's what that's what America is is now going to start um, turning towards uh, in 1815. Yeah, interesting. And, and again, both of you mentioned the internal improvements. Uh, I know it's called for Congress to do something about internal improvements, and asked in several speeches, uh, a few of the um, annual messages to Congress that he wants internal improvements, but then he but then he vetoes the internal improvements bill that Congress gives him. And then his response is, before you do this, you should have, what he really wanted Congress to do was pass an amendment that would give them the constitutional authority to pass such bills. So I'm uh, constantly calling on Congress to, to an amendment. This is one of my knowledge. This is the only amendment that Madison ever advocated. He used to pass uh, to an amendment going that would give them the constitutional authority to, to offer internal improvements. And when they don't do it, Congress presents a bill to them and to Madison anyway, saying, "Here's an improvements bill." Madison vetoes it. In his recent, in his veto message, he said, "Look, I had to, to, to you know to start an amendment before you did this, and they do it, but he vetoes it anyway. It just meant in passing." But the, now, amendments? You mean that's the amendment he promoted as president? No, oh, okay. okay, right. Yeah, of course, there's the the bill of rights. Rights, what would be the Bill of Rights, but as president, I think the only amendment he ever recommends yeah. is one that authorizes Congress to to deal with internal improvements. And Congress sort of doesn't want to do that. They just give him the bill. They pass the bill anyway. Now, government. that's really interesting in light of the fact that, that you, you, you're pointing that out. It's really interesting in light of the fact that Madison signed the charter for the Second Bank of the United States, yeah, which he right. very strongly opposed uh, right. 25 years earlier. Yeah, and his argument in favor of doing that was or reasons for doing that is one of his reasons is the I bank had become settled in the minds of the American people being constitutional. Mm -hmm. The American people had just 
come to come to believe there was something constitutional about the national bank. So Matt almost kind of acquiesced in that in a way. As I would say though, not not in a flip flopping way, but acquiesced to the will of the people, Republican, lowercase r Republican way. Does that make him a living constitutionalist then? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> that the meaning of the Constitution can change based on what the ratifies through a series of elections? That's a good, it's, yeah, that would be an, that's an, that's an interesting question. Hey, well, I'll just mention that that wasn't his only reason for accepting yeah. it, right? He yeah. believed that, yeah. Now that those dastardly I mean, Federalists aren't running it. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's, it's now, now I can see that it's not such a big, as long as it's in the hands of people who aren't a faction. Right. Well, anyway, the other reason he gives is, uh, but look, in the 1790s, he was arguing that the, 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 the national bank would be both necessary and proper. And Madison always conceded that it might be proper, but it wasn't necessary. After the War of 1812, it also became pretty clear to everybody that a national bank was necessary. You weren't able to pay troops and provide supplies and these things. So um, if he flip-flopped at all on that, it's, that it, it's, it's a flip-flop in the sense that, okay, I, I see now that it was necessary. I didn't see that it was necessary. It wasn't necessary. Now it's become necessary. I see that. Um, he gave a couple of other reasons for that as well. <laughs> We've been down the road of, um, of course, there are problems with the way I just portrayed that, I know. Um, but uh, but we've been moving toward this bigger question and what actually sort of culminate with is do we view Madison's presidency as success or a failure, especially in light of the scholarship that you that you you've both been mentioning? The consensus is you know, that it's not a complete failure, but we don't really think of Madison's presidency as a success or as a model for modern presidents. Why do you think that is, and should we? When should we think of Madison's presidency as a success, if we fall? Um. I, I don't know that I have a, a good answer, but I'll, I'll go ahead and I'm going to let Joe have the, the last word. But um, I think uh, there, it's very anticlimactic when you think about how successful he'd been in his in his uh, previous uh, politics. Um, and I think that he was he was hurt by the fact that his presidency was so dominated, at least for the first six years of it, by foreign policy considerations. And it's, it's um, my own opinion is, is just thinking about uh, Ketchum's biography, and maybe I'm misinterpreting what, what Ketchum says about this, but Madison and Jefferson never quite wrapped their minds around, at least as presidents, never quite wrapped their minds around how foreign policy worked. So it, it, it led to, they weren't hard enough uh, about some of these things. For instance, the, the idea that the embargo was going to bring Britain to heel. Uh, you know, the, now the benefit of 200 years of hindsight that says, when was the last time sanctions ever worked? Uh, but, but the idea that you were as little Trade Britain was a massive part of the American uh, export economy, but the United States was only a tiny fraction of the British economy. It was that we were going to uh, uh, solve problems through economic sanctions, I, I think was in a way utopian and, and and presented the sticking with that was was it you unfortunate consequences both in terms of our foreign policy but also straining relations between the sections in the country. Mm -hmm. I can just play with that for a second. I've, I I agree more with that assessment, and, and but because of that misunderstanding of the effect we could have on Britain through the embargo, I think this is my criticism of Madison's leadership. It, it kind of put him in a box, and in a way, it almost led inevitably to, to where we had, in 1812, we had to make a decision as to whether to go to war or, or other political developments at the time. You know, Napoleon's still running around and doing what he needed to do. Right. We were, we were under pressing really himself into a corner to where, in, in 1812, we had to choose whether to openly side with France or they should these things, and, and Madison, Madison chose. Yeah, and, and, if, and if I could say one more 10-second thing, I think that the, a problem for both Jefferson and Madison was a distrust or dislike of Britain that verged on the pathological. And so they put themselves in a position, they put themselves in exactly the position that Washington's farewell address says we should never be 
again. We should never be a, a, an automatic friend to any nation, but we should also never be an automatic enemy to any nation. And I, this sort of I don't know, pathological is too strong, but this very strong distrust of England, I need them to do things that may not have been in the national interest. Yeah, I'm going to stay there. So you get the last word. Any thoughts on this presidency or anything else that you want to give? How we get you? Did you, you? You didn't mute yourself, did you? I'm back now? Yeah, here you go. I can hear you, too. Okay. All right. There's just a little lull there. Um, he would test him a little bit at the end so I could come back and say something nice about him in contrast. Um, and Madison is clearly not a great president, not an overwhelming, successful administration. What I would say is Madison is a beautiful, honorable, noble president. Um, he, he's sort of harkening back to an older era where national honor and national pride matter. The right thing matters. Um, so, I mean, look at that war message to Congress. It's all about how mean and nasty Great Britain is and how we've tried really hard to make peace with them. And they're seizing our citizens on the open seas and impressing them into the Navy. If we have any pride as a nation or any honor, we do something about this. And so I think um, there's a little, bit of a, there's a real strong strain of idealism in Madison's presidency. We're going to have a war, but I'm not going to ag- aggrandize the executive through it. Um, and I think in that way, I think we can really respect and understand Madison's presidency as the to uh, um, not let realism dominate constitutional government and break it down. Okay, so we we met a disagreement. That's good. <laughs> but we can say so we can admit that Madison's uh, Madison didn't always make the best decisions in foreign policy, but we can still respect his. His motives and his sense of honor, I think, right? Yeah, so, yeah. His yeah. idealism. His idealism. Okay, yeah, very good. Once, a ba- once again, we see a kind of attempt, early attempt to balance uh, real and idealism somehow. In this. So, yeah, yeah I, know, I think. Thank you both, gentlemen, very much for your thoughts and insights. This has been fantastic. Um, as always, I've learned a, a great deal, and, uh, and I do appreciate it. So, best of both of you. Thanks. Thanks for um, being part of this. Yep. No, it was great. I'm glad you could do it, especially with your, both of your busy schedules. And, Joe, I know you're traveling, too, so but to both. Um, and thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for our teachers who have joined us. Thanks for your questions. Um, if you've enjoyed today's conversation, take a look at the uh, courses offered through our, our Master of Arts in American History and Government program, which you can more out uh, about uh, as I said earlier at tah.org or teachingamericanhistory.org. Saturday webinar will be October 10th, 11 Eastern Time on Andrew Jackson, Democracy in a Country Expanded. And I'll be, hey, by, uh, right? by, hey. I'll be Jeremy Bailey of the University of Houston. So uh, look forward to seeing that. But thanks again. That was great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, you, Chris. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Hopefully, this again. Yeah, we will. We'll find time to do it again. We'll yeah. play, play, play road show that doesn't travel. <laughs> when I wrote down your seventh annual message reference, that was really good. I, um, um, I teach this class on American political thought from the end, of basically era of good feelings up through the Civil War that I developed for the grad students, and that's what I start with. Okay. So interesting, huh? Great. Well, I'll take that because that's a, that's really interesting. That's the shift, really, in this in this exact moment in time. I'd never really thought about it that way before. And uh, the only the, like I said, the only insight I had was as I was trying to prep this course, I was just reading all the sort of standard histories I could get my hands on, and they all meant this is a cutoff point. They all have a reason for it. So, uh, you know, the, the uh, Oxford History of the United States uh, series. Daniel Walker Howe's got the 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 in that goes 1815 to 1848, or the older series, the, the um, New American Nation series, the one that David Potter's The Impending Crisis comes out of. The uh, the Era of Good Feelings is done by a guy named George Dangerfield, who apparently was the standard historian of this era in the previous generation. And it's interesting because they all have the same reasons for that cut. 
Uh, made when I when I when they said that, and I started thinking about what I'd read what I'd read primary source wise. It made a ton of sense. Interesting. Amazing. Very. Thanks. Yeah. So are we are we private by the way? It's just the just. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Just, yeah. I, yeah. Anyway, uh, I just didn't know what was. I don't. I don't know how these things work. Uh, of limited technological ability. Well, basically, we're all, we're always live. Everybody can hear. But we record we record these for the view later if they want to come back and click on a link and rewatch it. And I think we edit out the some of the private conversations at the beginning and the end. That's so. nice. So, so basic rule of politics then: if there's a microphone in front of me, assume that it's on. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for the lesson, Reagan. Right. Yes. Yeah.